is Carmen Mazzera, Executive Director of the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs, or APSIA. I'm delighted today to welcome, to welcome Michael Saffel from the Institute for International Education, who's here to talk to you about the Boren Fellowships and the Boren Awards and the opportunities they can provide to your students. As we go through the presentation, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in that chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. And just to make sure I'm not completely talking to myself, if folks can hear me, could we uh, have you type in the chat box that you can? Can folks hear me? Can you type in the chat box? Michael, can you hear me? Let's start with that. I can hear you. <laughs> That's me. That's, that's you. Let's do a quick sound check. Stephanie, Dina, can either of you hear me? Hopefully, hopefully. Not just talking to myself. Sonorous as I'm sure that is for everyone. Let's do a quick check and make sure we're good to go. I see Stephanie typing. Hopefully response to whether or not she can hear me. Oh, great. So with that, we will kick off the presentation. And like I said, if you have questions as we go through, please feel free to put them in the chat box. And I'm sure that several of our other colleagues will join us as we go through uh, from different parts of the US. And so you may hear me repeat this message again. But again, thank you all for being here. And thanks in particular to Michael for sharing his wisdom. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Michael Saffel. I work for the Born Awards Program, which is probably something you already know. Uh, the Born Awards Program was actually set up. Um, we, are, we are administered through the Institute of International Education. We're about to celebrate our 100th birthday, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, IIE does a lot of programs, of course. We do the Fulbright, as you most of you are familiar with, the Gilman Scholarship, Project Go, things like that. Uh, so we have a lot of experience at IIE administering programs like this. I myself have been working on the BORN program since about 2005. Uh, I've been an advisor to the fellowships for most of that, and that is our graduate program. Uh, but I, recently I've been doing more outreach on both the undergrad and graduate program. Uh, currently I'm also the advisor for the South Asian Flagship Languages Initiative and the Indonesian Flagship Language in, in, in Initiative, and I will uh, talk about those later. The program was created uh, in Congress in 1991. We started actually sending awards uh, people out uh, on the award in 1994, so we've been around for a long time. We do promote long-term study abroad. We promote uh, serious language study. And we do promote public service, and we'll get into that. But these are our three cores of the program. And that uh, gentleman in the application is uh, Senator Bourne, uh, who this program is named after. Senator Bourne just recently retired as the University of Oklahoma president. Eligibility. Uh, the eligibility of this program, you have to be a US citizen. This program is funded through the Department of Defense, the National Security Education Program. Uh, this program does require you to be a citizen uh, by the time the application is due. So if you're an undergraduate applying, they have to have their citizenship all worked out by February 7th, 2019. And if they're a graduate student, they have to have their citizenship worked out by January 30th, 2019. Uh, they have to be interested in studying a foreign language in an eligible world region, and we'll talk about that later. And they have to maintain their matriculation at a US institution, or at least applying to graduate school if they're going for the fellowship when they apply. What does that mean? That basically means they have to be a student in good standing. As for the undergraduate award, the scholarship, they have to be already in a program. So if you're working at a US school, you're in good shape. Uh, any of your students would be eligible to apply for the award. We're not taking awards, uh, applications from graduate, you know, high school seniors at this point. They have to at least be a freshman when they apply. Uh, if they are students that are looking, uh, what do we call this, graduating seniors. So if they are looking to graduate in May 2019, 
they can still apply to either the scholarship for the undergrads or the fellowship for the graduate school. They will be required if they apply for the undergraduate award to postpone their official graduation from undergrad until they get back from the Boren. That will not uh, prevent them from walking in May, but they just can't officially graduate on paper until they get back from their Boren. 99% of schools out there are okay with this, uh, but if your school is not one of those, they are still free to apply to the fellowship if they are going on to graduate school immediately. We do focus on national security in this program. So part of the application process, you have to make an argument for why the country and language you're interested in is important to US national security. We do, we do not have a definition of what national security means on our website, nor do we want one. This program basically allows the applicant to make that argument themselves. And that argument doesn't have to go into every detail of why, let's say, Japan is important to US national security. You can hit that on many different levels. You can talk about it in an economic way, the Japan, Japan being the number third or fourth largest economy in the world. Uh, you can talk about it in a geopolitical way. You can talk about it in a technology, a STEM way. There are many ways you could go that, way, that route and talk about national security. You want to focus it on the student's interest. So if a student is a uh, roboticist, uh, and wants to go to Japan to learn about Japanese robotics, uh, they can make that argument, um, that STEM kind of argument in their application. They don't have to talk about the geopolitical or uh, economic reasons. They focus on what they know. Stay in your lane, as the, as the kids say. So just that's FYI. The other half of the, uh, of the program is basically asking, what do you plan on doing uh, in the federal government after you graduate. Part of this program, what makes this program unique, is that there is a 12-month service requirement for uh, the majority of uh, people who win this award. All of the undergraduates, it's 12 months for the graduate students. Some of them will owe up to 15 months, depends on how long their award is, but at least a year for everybody. And in the application, the student is going to be required to talk about where they see themselves working in the federal government. That should relate to what they're studying, um, and the BORIN itself, the, the study abroad trip itself, should be something that will help them uh, get an inter interview for said job. In the application, you, I usually say to have one, uh, two or three examples of where they could work in the government, and we have preferred agencies where they can work, and we'll get into that later. But the long-term commitment is what we're looking for in the application process. So somebody who makes it sound like they want to do 12 months and that's it. You know, I'll do these 12 months because you're making me. That's not a strong application. We want people who are very interested in working in the government and potentially do that as a career. The focus on language and culture is also unique to our program. A lot of study abroad programs don't require a language, although you may be at a university that does. For the preferred languages on our program, uh, you do not have to have any background in the language. There's only two languages that have a um, that have a required minimum, and we'll get to that. But basically, anybody at any level uh, should be eligible for this award. So if you are interested in learning Arabic and you've never picked up a book before, that's fine. You you are still eligible for the award, and your application would reflect the interest of going from zero uh, or less than you know a little a less than novice to intermediate level, let's say. That could be your goal. If you're already at intermediate level, your goal is to get farther, maybe advanced. If you were a heritage speaker of a language and you haven't actually learned how to read and write in the language, um, uh, that, it, that could be your, your, your application, the reason for studying the language. So there are a lot of ways to achieve these goals and talk about it in your application. Do we have any questions thus far about uh, the basics of this program? I don't think so. I can see the chat window, but I want to double check. I think we're okay. Okay, I'm assuming I will be interrupted if we have questions, and which is fine. Please ask away. So let's get to brass tacks. What about the uh, maximum awards? So for the scholarship, the undergrad award, uh, we consider anything from six months to 12 months a year and you can apply for the full $20,000 uh, scholarship. 
if you are only doing a semester that's under six months, but over, you know between 12 weeks and you know five months and change, we consider that a semester. You can earn uh, win up to ten thousand dollars. If you are in a STEM field as an undergrad, you can apply for the Boren for a brief summer program up to eight weeks. You know between eight and 12 weeks. If you're a STEM student, you can apply for a full 12 months, but this is a program, the eight to 12 weeks is only for STEM students in undergraduate uh, programs. So if you have a computer science major who can only go overseas in July and August of 2019, this is, the, this is for them, or June and, Jul and June and July of 2019. Uh, we, we want to make sure that a STEM student who is at a university where they don't necessarily uh, allow students to go overseas for longer periods for, uh, where they can't miss a semester, uh, we want to make sure that they still have the opportunity to study abroad. And the government would love to have more STEM folks in, the, in, in their ranks, so this is a win-win for us. For the fellowship, the graduate program, it's a little different. You can win a little more money. Uh, can go from nine to twelve months. You get the full twenty-four thousand dollars. Six to nine months, twenty, and you can see the difference. Uh, semester is about twelve grand. We don't have the summer in, uh, STEM initiative for the fellowship, but we do allow domestic study on the uh, graduate program. So if I am a graduate student who wants to take a primer or a refresher in a language over the summer of 2019, and I would then go immediately overseas in the fall to a country to study the language as well. So the example here is I want to study Japanese. I would study at Middlebury or at my own university, a summer program, and then in the fall go to Tokyo to study for anywhere from six to 12 months. You can win up to $30,000 on the scholarship. That would be a combination of the 24,000 overseas and the 12,000 domestic. You can't go over 30. So if you win a full 24,000, that limits the amount of money you can win on your domestic. Uh, so that's just a FYI. What does the BORN exactly fund? Well, normally for the undergrads, we're funding most of that study abroad program. So the undergraduate uh, will go to their study abroad office, say I'm interested in learning Japanese, uh, and the study abroad office will give them options. Here is University of Tokyo, here is Aoyama Gakuen, here's Temple University. Uh, there are a lot of options in Tokyo. These are the ones that work well with your major or with your school. The, generally, all the heavy lifting is done by the study abroad department. Uh, you, the student knows the dates, the um, costs related to it, and they can punch that into their BORN application. We also cover airfare. Uh, we cover health insurance. Uh, we also cover matriculation fees. Those are the fees that are associated to a student to maintain their student status while uh, overseas. Sometimes students need those, sometimes they don't. Sometimes that's all part of the study abroad um, program. Uh, it all depends. So things we don't cover, pa passports, visas, and inoculation. So if they have to go to the, get some boosters before they go to India, uh, they're going to need to pay for that out of pocket. Uh, and then, of course, anything that is required for, like, some students ask us for rent money or pay their student loans. None of that's covered either. The Boren Fellowship is similar. We cover the same things. Um, in the most part, though, the Boren Fellows, the graduate students, they are not going to the study abroad office. They are, we call this Build-A-Bear. They're building their own program. Every program has to have a language component involved, but they also can involve a academic internship, some sort of research uh, program, um, what have you. Oftentimes, this will all be in one program. So they'll have language, research, and an internship all in one uh, program that lasts, again, anywhere between 3 and 12 months overseas. To build a budget, this, this part of the application is actually not as complicated as it looks like. Um, you're going to think about what is a average, what is an average round trip ticket to where you want to go. Again, if it's an undergrad, this may be part of the program cost and they don't have to really think about this very hard. Uh, for the graduate students, generally they have to think about these things themselves. Um, we, are, we are under the Fly America Act uh, restrictions. 
And if you're familiar with that, um, I would like to point out that the Department of Defense is different than the Department of State in the sense that the Department of State is allowed to use um, foreign carriers as part of an, a, an agreement. I forget what they call that agreement, but the DOD does not subscribe to that. So uh, generally what I say is go to a carrier like American Airlines or go to a carrier like Delta, search what it would cost to fly to China and back and use the average you know, economy price ticket as your guide. I would search for summer or Christmas. That's going to be the most expensive time to fly and put that into your budget. It's not going to probably be more expensive than that. Uh, the program and materials, of course, tuition to the overseas program that you're going to. Uh, if you need, you know, notebooks, um, books, things like that. Uh, we don't cover generally laptops or things like that, but, you know, it's, it's up to the student to put it in. Overseas medical insurance, that medical insurance has to cover the normal things, the um, emergency medical treatment at a hospital, uh, whether you have to be um, evacuated from a country, let's say you're studying in China, but your medical treatment requires you to be flown out to Germany or somewhere else, back to the U.S. Um, repatriation, which is, uh, if you've not heard of that, that is a fun one where if you uh, pass away overseas, that they will actually pay for the transportation of your remains back to the home uh, homeland. Uh, luckily, we've never had to use that, knock on wood. Uh, and of course, uh, living um, expenses, bed, you know, room and board, uh, local transportation. So all of that can be put into the budget. Uh, use your, sometimes this is a guess uh, or an estimate or a guesstimate, and you're just basically um, putting in what you think. The committee doesn't really look at this. This is something I worry about as an administrator, um, but it won't affect the application if it's off. Um, there's no low balling involved. So if an applicant tells me that they can do a 12 months in Japan for uh, 18,000 versus 20,000, and I have another applicant who's asking for the same program for 20,000, the committee doesn't look at the two numbers and say, well, we can save the government $2,000 if we pick the 18 grand one. It doesn't work like that. So don't lowball. It's easier to ask for less money than more money. So I think it's better just to put your actual costs. Actual costs also could be more than the 20,000 or 30,000 that we will award you. If your program is going to cost 50,000, go ahead and put 50,000 and explain why. We can't give you more than the maximum, but um, it's, it's good to know what the total costs are. So those are the traditional foreign programs. We also have a um, three initiatives that we started, ooh, maybe eight years ago, nine years ago, we started this African flagship languages initiative. I was actually the um, I was actually the advisor for this program when we first started. This program has changed a little bit over the years. We've added in lost countries, but uh, Tanzania and Swahili has been a remarkable success and we have been building upon that success for years. This program is a little different where normally if you wanted to learn Swahili on Boren, you would go to your study abroad office and find a program either in Kenya, Tanzania, you know. But this program that we have is money that is set aside just for Africa. So if you apply to the athlete program, you're applying to a uh, program that has maybe 75 applications and you're only in competition with those 75 people. So it's uh, instead of being uh, applying against the, you know, the 800 that we normally have for the undergraduate award or, uh, you know, three to 400 for the graduate award, you're applying to a small group of those people. Uh, you're, you're increasing your, your chances of winning this award. Uh, this is also the only program where you can learn French on the Boren. Uh, French is not considered a priority language, uh, but for this program, we actually will help you learn French. You'll learn some Wolof too, and we don't want to scare anybody off on that, but the French program is in Senegal. You learn French in the classroom, and you will have uh, your host family will be speaking Wolof to you pretty much all the time, so you kind of learn both. But the idea is to improve your French. You have to have intermediate French to qualify for this program. In the application, you will be you will be required to have an official language assessment from a French professor, uh, not a professor who happens to speak French, but somebody who actually teaches the French language. 
if you are selected to win the award, we will, uh, or at least as a finalist, we will test you ourselves also. Uh, but having that letter from the French professor, that's part of the you know feasibility of any application. Um, Portuguese, Swahili, Akan, Akan Tui, and Wolof and Zulu, none of those require any background. Um, so FYI, if you have a student who is interested in Africa and they have Spanish in their background already, if they've spoken Spanish, learned Spanish, um, they're going to make strong Portuguese applicants because the committee knows somebody who speaks Spanish already or at least has been studying Spanish uh, has, uh, will pick up the Portuguese a lot faster. So these programs are pretty cool. The three official programs we have is Senegal, Mozambique, and Tanzania. That means if you win an athlete, you have to do the, we do a summer program in uh, University of Florida for all of, all of these languages. And then you must go overseas in the fall. We have specific schools set up to help in this uh, in Senegal, Mozambique, and Tanzania for those first three languages. French, Portuguese, and Swahili. The student, if they win this award and accept it, they are saying they will do the summer program in University of Florida, summer 2019, and then in the fall go to these three countries. The students that are applying for Kantui, Wolof, and Zulu, Zulu South America, sorry, South Africa, Wolof is Senegal as well, Kantui is in Ghana, they have to find their own programs in the fall. We don't have any specific programs. These languages are not as popular in our, in our application cycle. So we don't have the number of students that we would need every year to support a program overseas. Swahili, Portuguese, French, we get a lot of applications for. The other three, not so much. So then again, if you have a student who's interested in Africa and they're very, they're very open to different uh, languages and areas in Africa to study, this may be where you point them to because there's less competition. And I'm sure we'll have questions about that. You just let me know. So this program was very successful for many years, and we decided to add to it. Uh, so we got a chunk of money the government gave us, and uh, we added it to, and we added a South Asian flagship languages initiative, SAFLI. Now this program is in India, and it is for Hindi and Urdu. Similar to AFLI, where you would study uh, domestically, this program has a summer program in University of Wisconsin, Madison. Uh, it's about six to eight weeks. It's one of those programs where you're not allowed to speak anything but the target language. It's very intense. And then from there, they fly you to uh, India. Uh, in India, you go to two different areas depending on the language you choose. Um, there is an option, just like an athlete, to extend your time uh, into the spring if you want to do basically stick around. It's the um, AIIS, and if you haven't heard of that program, it's very popular for international, study, uh, inter international folks studying the language. Uh, they can stay at the school that they're already at, or they can find another school somewhere else in India to continue on with the language. That is something that is optional, but it makes for a more, uh, a more competitive application the longer, time, the longer you're overseas. But this program, again, is self-funded. Uh, so if somebody was already interested in going to India, this maybe you steer them to the SAFLI versus a normal born award. Uh, we had 24, I believe, 24 to 30 applications last year for 12 spots, so it was it was pretty um, it was pretty good for the applicant. Last year we started a brand new program, the Indonesian flagship language, we should be language initiative because it's only one language, uh, that is a typo, but it is a program also through University of Wisconsin Madison. It is uh, summer there and then overseas to Indonesia. Uh, where you learn Indonesian, which um, is I've been heard called Indonesian or Bahasa Indonesia. So this program is um, is going to be. We had similar numbers. We had about 24 applications last year for 12 spots. So it's a really strong. If you're already interested in Indonesia, this is great. Uh, also has that optional uh, option to extend your program in the spring. Um, and there is no background required for Indonesian or, you know, Hindi or Urdu to qualify for these programs. So these programs have been very popular. They're getting more popular. Hopefully they grow. I've seen it grow a lot in the last 10 years. So I'm very happy with this. Uh, folks who have a ROTC population on campus, um, and also I would say people, you know, veterans and things like that, these people, uh, these, this group of students are very popular for our program. Uh, we are very happy to have ROTC and, and military veterans apply to the Boren. Uh, they get special consideration. 
uh, when they apply. We already know their interest in national security and, and public service is uh, has been proven, especially the veterans, but uh, also the ROTC students who have signed up for their for their military uh, commitments. Um, just fantastic applicants. They get they get special uh, mention during the application process. We mention it to the committee while they're everybody's in the same room. We tell them when they're reading the application. We basically hammer it in that saying, "Hey, these are the kind of students we like." applications from and they make very strong government employees so that is a um, that is something that if you have this population ROTC students tend to not know if they're eligible for this program we have a project go which is for ROTC and you guys may have heard of that especially if you're at a project go school but they're also eligible for the Boren, so we want to make sure they know that and sometimes it just means talking to their commanding officer or the person who runs the ROTC program to make sure that they know that they're eligible so this is a communication issue. This gives you um, not the most up-to-date numbers in 2017, but this gives you a good idea of how we rate when it comes to the uh, the people who apply for the award. 90 odd, 93 percent of our uh, born fellows are doing six to 12 months overseas, and most of them are doing nine to 12 months overseas. We uh, it's a little less for the uh, for the undergrads, it's, it looks like 75%. The reason why it's so high is that we have this financial carrot, of course, tied to it. You can only get the full 20000 if you hit six months or more for the undergrad award. You can only win the $24,000 if you hit that nine to 12 months. So there is a financial carrot dangling there for the student, but also for the committee, we're very interested in long-term study abroad. We understand, and you guys probably do as well, that the longer you're overseas, the better your language will improve. Um, so if somebody who's studying for six months versus somebody who's studying for three months will do a lot better, and of course somebody who's studying for 12 months will do better than the person who's studying for six. Uh, for the undergrad award, 20 odd percent win for under a semester. Most of those folks make very compelling reasons in their application why they can only do one semester. Uh, actually, the letters of reference, the letters of recommendation actually do a good job of explaining it for the student. Uh, normally there is a scholarship involved or there's some reason why they can't do more than six months. But if a student started this award June 1st, 2019, which is the earliest you can start, and then stretched it to the end of December 2019, they hit the six months, they only miss one traditional semester, and usually I can sell a student uh, to take that much time off. They qualify for the $20,000, they're in the preferred length of time, bada bing, bada boom, you know. Uh, that 4.1% are the STEM folks. The, not only, you know, STEM folks can stay, again, STEM students uh, for the scholars can be in overseas for 12 months, uh, but that 4.1% is for the STEM initiative alone. And uh, compared to the U.S. students abroad, most folks are staying only summer programs. And as most of you know, the study abroad trends are for shorter programs. So uh, we, we try to buck that trend here at Boren. Country preferences, if you're good with maps, um, the green countries are our preferred countries. The uh, blue countries are countries that have uh, we have not been able to send folks to in the last uh, couple of years, some of them recently, but some of them for a while. Uh, for example, Russia. We, uh, we lost Russia a few years ago. Um, we are still sending folks to learn Russian in all the countries that surround it, and you can see that in the, all the green areas surrounding Russia. Almost all those countries are, are fine with us. Ukraine is a special case. If, you learn, if a student wants to study in the Ukraine, they have to do it as far west. Uh, you know, they have to basically be in the capital or, or even farther west. They have to be studying Ukrainian, not Russian. But if folks are interested in Russian, they can apply to Latvia, Estonia, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan. Um, all of these are okay. Uh, right now, Turkey is out. Uh, but if you want, if you have a student who's interested in Turkish, uh, there is a program, I believe American Councils is doing it, but it may be SIT. It's in Azerbaijan. Uh, if a student is interested in Persian or Farsi, they can, there's an American Councils program in Tajikistan. So the countries we can't send people to are, um, usually we have a backup. If somebody is interested in Nigeria, for example, uh, Nigeria, we're not sending folks to uh, this year, 2018, 2019. But if somebody was interested in learning Yoruba, 
um, or they were lin or one of the other languages there. They could study in Benin. So we try to always have a backup. You'll notice that the Western Europe is out. North America outside of Mexico is out. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, that's out. We, we do not send people to that part of the world. Um, there are a few countries that have uh, travel warnings like Venezuela. We're not going to be able to send anybody to Venezuela anytime soon. Not that anybody really wants to go there. Um, the Honduras is a little iffy. So there are certain countries that um, that we can't send because of dangerous reasons, uh, like physical danger, and there's some are more political. The countries that are whited out that aren't necessarily that are still in the the traveling. Let's let's look at the above China. We have Mongolia. Mongolia is a country that is doesn't really have any um, political or uh, violent reason why we can't send somebody there. It's just not technically considered preferred. Uh, similar to uh, Bolivia or Ecuador, you know. Um, those countries a student could still apply to because they're in the region of the world where we're okay with. Uh, they're just not considered preferred countries. It's the student's job to then make the argument of why that country should be preferred. I can think of three or four great reasons why Mongolia should be a preferred country, even though technically in Boren it's not. I can still win an award to go to Mongolia. I can't do the same thing with Australia because it's outside of our region, but I can make that, that argument for Mongolia. If a student is bent on applying for a country that has an asterisk, which is, again, these blue countries, um, there's a handout that you may or may not have received that has a list of these countries, and then we can get it to you if you want it. But these country preferences, the like, say if somebody really wants to study in Russia, their program is in Russia, the study abroad program is in St. Petersburg, and they have absolutely, uh, they're committed to applying to Russia. They need to have a backup country in their application. So understanding that students didn't go to Russia in 2019, I can also do a similar program in Latvia. So they have to have that extra step in their application. And I can go into, into that with a, a campus rep. Our language preferences, any of these languages, again, you don't have to have a lick of in your background to apply. You can be an ex a perfect beginner. Um, the only languages uh, that we have the background, uh, that you need a background in would be French and Spanish. French for the AFLI program, you need to be intermediate or better. And for the Spanish, you have to be an advanced speaker of Spanish. Uh, unless you're a STEM student, you can have intermediate level. But Spanish is the number one spoken language outside of English in the US government. It's not considered a priority language. We do, however, understand that if somebody is studying at a very high level of Spanish, and maybe they're going for a, a technical Spanish that is not available in the US, for example, they are learning about, they want to really join the Drug Enforcement Agency or uh, something like that, and they want to learn the lingo that would be associated with this. So they're going down to uh, South America to learn Spanish at that level. Uh, they're going to do an internship. Everything they do is in Spanish. Uh, we still give out a few Spanish awards every year for that kind of thing. In general, I suggest that a Spanish speaker apply for Portuguese, whether it be Brazil uh, or Angola or in Mozambique. Those are That would be where I point most of my Spanish speakers. Uh, but it is possible to win a Spanish award. The field of study preferences are the least important of our preferences. Um, we tend to find that people, no matter what field of study they're in, usually if they can make the argument about national security and where they want to work in the government, and it makes sense, it, it, seems, um, it seems plausible to the committee, it doesn't matter what your background is, what you're studying, they'll let you in. I was an American Studies major. It doesn't show up in this, but it's similar enough to U.S. history. Uh, it's it's uh, I could make that argument pretty easily, even in an English major or an education major. It's, this isn't a big uh, stumbling stone. It shouldn't be for your applicants, your potential applicants. What ties up a lot of applications, or what or what gets makes it hard to sell this program on your students, is understanding what the job uh, requirements are what this service requirement is. You do have to work for the federal government for at least 12 months, and that can be daunting. That could be something that scares away a lot of your potential applicants. Um, they should know that there is a support system for them. There is a dedicated team at NSEP that is full of former born fellows and scholars that work at NSEP now, and their sole job is to find jobs and help students apply for jobs uh, in the government. 
So if I'm an alum of the program, I get an email at least once or twice a week from NSEP office saying, hey, this, oh, this, position, this government agency is hiring. Um, here's what they're looking for. And instead of a thousand or more people applying to the same job from usajobs.gov, you're, it's only a, maybe a baker's dozen from the born alum who are applying to this job. So it's a much, it's a much easier way to go. Uh, you can still apply the traditional way and get a job in the government. What we want to make sure is clear, though, is that we don't hand a job to anybody. We don't force somebody to take a job, which can be a worry for some people, but we also don't hand them a job, which would be a relief to some people. So when you finish the Boren and you graduate, we don't say, okay, you're in the CIA. Okay, you are in State Department. So it, it, it doesn't work like that. They have to find the jobs themselves. We do give them uh, special hiring authorities that help them achieve this. Uh, hiring authorities that will allow them to get interviews, that will allow them to apply for jobs that otherwise um, they wouldn't be able to without. Uh, we have a federal seminar, a federal employment seminar every September for alumni uh, that we in, we fly people in from around the country who have completed their boring to partake in a two-day seminar to get them ready for that federal job search. And it culminates in a job fair-like situation where they meet a lot of representatives from agencies in D.C. A student does not, a, a born does not have to work in D.C. to work off their service. They can do it anywhere in the world as long as it's a U.S. government program. Uh, but D.C. has a lot of opportunities, of course. Uh, yeah. The priority agencies, and these are the agencies that the student will want to mention in their application, are these uh, DOD, DOS, the Department of Homeland Security, and the intelligence community. That's about 13 or so. Maybe it's more um, programs like the NSA, CIA, you know, things like that, Naval Intelligence. So those, um, all of these are considered priority agencies. And if a student is talking about a job they want in that, in that agency, in their application. They want to be more specific than saying, I want to work for the Department of Defense. They want to have a specific job and why it relates to what they're studying, and probably two options. If you have a student that's interested in development work and they want to work at the Peace Corps, it's a fantastic job. Peace Corps does count toward your service, but they probably want to talk about uh, the possibility of working in Peace Corps or um, USAID. Two similar programs, not exactly the same, of course, but one USAID, we put that under the um, Department of State umbrella, and that counts as a preferred institution, or preferred agency. So other agencies uh, that have import, uh, employed born in the past are as follows, NASA, Department of Agriculture, Department of Energy, Commerce, all these places work. You can also work for a government contractor, as long as that government contract is 80 or more percent with a uh, government agency that would fit the national security um, paradigm, uh, that would count as well. So there are a lot of options out there. Uh, there are even as much, you could still do um, volunteer work at certain places uh, in the government and it would count. So there are a lot of options to work off the service that shouldn't be an impotent, uh, that shouldn't stop someone from applying for the program. And here's, here's a list. This, uh, this um, presentation, by the way, is online at bornawards.org, so you can get all these links. We put these links out there mostly so the student can kind of see for themselves what's available and use some of the specific examples in their application. The application does require two essays, um, at least two, one or two letters of recommendation. One, one, let's see, two letters, one or two from the undergrads. Uh, two to three from the graduate program. Uh, I believe we may we may ask for three nowadays. Uh, in reality, if they get us uh, one less than our maximum, we're usually fine. Uh, but we don't tell them that. The letters of recommendation, as any application should be, this is the Trojan horse of information. Um, you basically can uh, have your letters, your recommenders write all sorts of wonderful things about the applicant. Uh, it should, we do ask specific questions about the feasibility of their program and things like that. So it's a good idea for the people who write the letters to know what it is the student is applying for, where they want to go overseas, and also what they want to do in the government. All of that can come out in the letter of recommendation. If a student is doing a research program or doing some sort of research overseas, especially the graduate students, uh, one of the letters of recommendation should be from their research advisor. Uh, transcripts don't have to be official, but they need to be um, accurate uh, when they upload them to the application process. If they win the award, we will ask for official transcripts. 
the letter of overseas affiliation is something that graduate students tend to get. It's not required. Um, sometimes it's impossible to get, but if they can get one, it all helps with their feasibility. Uh, but a, undergrads will have that study abroad program information um, attached. So that means if they're applying to Qasid University in Jordan through their university's study abroad office, there's usually an online uh, one or two page PDF they can make and they can attach that to their application. So the reviewers can kind of sum through it and see what's going on. The essay are, of course, the most important part of the application, essay one being more important than essay two, I would say, because this is where you're selling the national security and your government, um, your government work. Uh, you have about 800 words to get this done. It's not a big essay. Uh, this, the, the, the number one way this fails someone, this is, and I find this every time I look at somebody's application who asks me to review it, is that they spend 80 or 90 percent of their time talking about the national security argument and only 20 percent or less talking about where they want to work in the government. A well-balanced essay is required on this. Uh, you shouldn't be spending any less time talking about where you want to work in the government than you are about the national security reasons, uh, or national security reasons why that country you're going to is important. Uh, that tends to be the easier argument, which is why the essays tend to favor that, um, but you have to watch out for that. Make sure that you're giving enough detail about where you want to work in the feds uh, and you're, you're, you're demonstrating that long-term interest in government service. Essay 2, you're talking about the program specifics. Uh, so this is, I'm going to the University of Japan, or Tokyo University, and I'm going there because it matches the things that I'm looking for in a program. It has a very intense Japanese program, which is good for me because I'm already at intensive level. Um, I'm also looking to do research on campus to yada yada, or there's an internship um, opportunity in Tokyo, which is why I want to study in Tokyo. So you're making your, your argument of why you chose what you chose. You're also talking about specifics. This is the, many, this is the number of hours I'll be doing in, in the language every week. Average is usually for an undergrad 10 to 15, for graduate 15 to 20 hours a week on the language. Uh, and then you start talking about the things that are outside of the classroom. I'm going to volunteer. I'm going to, vol I'm going to join a hiking club. I'm going to do all these things. I'm going to live with a homestay family. I'm going to do all these things that not only am I learning the language, I'm learning the culture, and the ROI on me is very strong. My re the return on investment of that twenty to $30,000 you're going to give me is going to be repaid. And here is what I'm going to do when I get back from my born to maintain my language. That's the thing that a lot of people forget. Uh, or how are you going to maintain your Farsi, your, your Urdu, your Japanese when you get back to the U.S.? So have that in mind as well. We're wrapping up here, uh, so start thinking about your questions. The deadline for the scholarship, the undergraduate award, is February 7th, 2019. The deadline for the graduate program is January 30th, 2019. Um, a lot of campuses have a campus rep who is uh, going to be working with the applicants. Uh, you may be that campus rep. Uh, if not, you can um, look it up on our website or I can help you find it. On-campus deadlines sometimes are earlier than the national deadline. This gives the uh, campus rep time to organize the applications. If you're at a school that has a lot of applications, like Georgetown or American University, uh, they have a pretty strong, you know, usually a 30-day or longer application deadline before the, uh, the deadline, uh, national deadline. Uh, for some schools that don't get a lot of applications, that deadline could be the same day. The campus rep has about two days after the national deadline to submit uh, submit everything for us. And it's not a lot of work, but it is something that we can walk you through if you've never done it before. And I think we're in our last slide here. Uh, my contact information is born at IIE.org, so that's always good uh, to, I, can, I answer that inbox. A lot of us do, but I'm, I'm one of the main guys that reply to that. The 800 number you see there actually rings directly to my desk. Uh, Born Awards is our website. Um, I don't think you really need our our DC address, but if you uh, if you want to send me a postcard, go for it. Uh, our Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. We actually have a, some testimonials, and the, and the Twitter we tend to put out um, we tend to put out information about upcoming webinars and things like that. We do webinars every year. We do about forty or fifty of them. Uh, we're actually setting those up now. Uh, our application went live last week, uh, and it will maintain, you know, obviously it will be on there until the deadline. The 
Um, a few of us are going to be traveling around the country visiting schools. I'll be in um, Oregon. Uh, I'll be in Virginia, Maryland, D.C., of course. And I think I'm also visiting Arkansas and Texas twice. Texas is a big state, so I have to go. I have to go two times. Uh, and there will be some of us in other in other states around the country. So if you're interested in that, let me know as well. All right, I think that is the gist. Now you have left time for questions if you have them. Thanks, Michael. And as folks, please feel free to type your questions in that chat box. We cannot hear you, and hopefully you can still hear us. Um, and since my mic does work, I get the privilege of the first question, though. Would you recommend if students aren't sure what they want to do or feel pulled in several directions that they apply to a traditional born, an athlete, and a sapley? Or do you think that will you look at multiple applications or, or does it have to be uh, or can they cast a wide net? It's a good question. Uh, they have to apply only once. Um, they, we only accept one application, so they have to decide beforehand where they want to apply. I think somebody who is more open should apply to the athletes. Sorry, the fleas, the athlete, safley, or ifly. If they have no real specific uh, place they want to go, it gives them the best chance of winning because they're in a very small uh, application pool versus the, the larger pool. Um, but it all depends on what they're interested in. There's no, that, that is the only place where you have an advantage. I think if it comes to a traditional born, if they're not, um, if they're looking just at a normal born award as a scholar or a fellow, uh, I get the question a lot, which is the most competitive language? There is no real competitive language. We don't have a, um, we don't have a, uh, a, what is the word I'm looking for? A quota. So what we do is generally base it on the percentage of applications. So if we have 15% of our applications for Mandarin, which is normal, it's our no Chinese and Arabic are number one and two languages every year. Uh, we generally tend to have uh, winners or recipients to be a representative of the application pool. So if we have 15% Mandarin applications, we try not to have 30% Mandarin winners for the born. Um, we try to keep it in line. And the opposite is true. If we have 15% Mandarin applications, we try to make sure we don't have 7% of our winners be Mandarin. We try to keep it close to what the what the application numbers are. Sometimes it's unavoidable. We just happen to get a ton of great applications, and it's hard not to. But in general, we stick to uh, the percentages of our applications. That's great. And in terms of the advisors that are that are online with us right now, um, they, how can they receive materials from you and get on their mailing list? Actually, one is in Maryland and, one, and a few are in Texas. So how, oh, how can they get to meet the live and in person, Michael? So um, that born at IIE.org, uh, send a request. Uh, and just you can mention my name. Say, hey, I just listened to your webinar. It'll give me a good good feedback on that as well. And just say, hey, I just listened to your webinar. You may already have a campus rep um, on your campus. I can find that out for you. Uh, but yeah, so uh, for example, I'm going to Baylor. I'm going to University of um, Texas, Ran ooh, Rio Grande Valley, which is right on the border. Uh, I'm going to Houston Uni University of Houston. Um, uh, a lot. I'm going to a lot of schools, <laughs> Texas A&M, Prairie View A&M. So I'll be I'll be around uh, Texas. So if you are you are in Texas, we're also having a campus rep workshop, um, which we in, is free for anyone to come to um, in Houston. I believe October 11th. So uh, I can give you all that information. Just send me an email at boren at iie.org. It works way better than the phone. <laughs> <laughs> How very technologically advanced you are, and if. To kind of take a step back, you know, one of the things we assume is that students want to go abroad and they want to learn these languages. As advisors talk to students for whom this may be, pardon the pun, a, a foreign concept, what what case would you make? What what changes do you find right. in students because of the program? What we try to emphasize, and I think this is true for any study abroad, is the the resume building that this does. Um, when you know the whole idea of college for most people is to prepare themselves for a professional career, um, I believe study abroad is one of the best things you can do to prepare yourself for jobs. Even if you never work overseas, it's one of those things that stands out uh, on a resume. Um, I was a jet, so I lived in Japan for two years after I graduated from Maryland, 
Um, and that was one of the things that got me an interview at IIE. Uh, but I know a lot of places, financial and, and, and other program, programs that have nothing to do with overseas work, that will still see somebody who has been able to go overseas, survive, <laughs> and, uh, and, not, and, and do well as a, as a great recommendation. Like it's something that bodes well for them as an employee no matter what the job is. So um, one of those things I try to tell students who are just kind of on the fence with study abroad, or I tell this to uh, high school students going into college, I said, make sure you carve out a semester or two to go overseas because it's, it's one of the best things you can do for your career, much less personal growth. On the flip side of that, how would you talk to students who might be concerned about the federal hiring piece from an availability of jobs as well as the current climate about public service with a .gov. Right, and I think that's where we basically, you, you have to read the student. Is the student a cyber cybersecurity uh, student, or somebody who's interested in national security, uh, or is the student more of a development, um, interested in more, um, like I have a student who's interested in human trafficking. Um, where can they do, you know, good work? Um, or work that would be something that would be suited toward, to them. And understand that the government is a very large organization that has lots of different uh, places for lots of different people. Uh, and, and that's where that, that, you know, you could work for the CIA, but you could also work for the Peace Corps. So there is a, a big range of, uh, of government jobs that kind of suit different personalities. So if you're somebody who wants to do well, you know, do good in the world, and not to say that working for the CIA isn't, but, uh, you know, if I'm working for the USAID or I'm working for the Peace Corps, this is definitely, for some students, that's going to be the, the, uh, the draw for the program. Um, you're not necessarily, you know, the executive branch is just one branch of the government. You don't have to work for the White House. You don't have to work for Congress. There are a lot of jobs out there that, um, again, may no, be nowhere near the, the White House. Uh, it's not all State Department. And, and will service on the Hill count as well? Yep. Uh, not locally. So if you work at a, um, if you work at your state house, it's not going to count. But if you work for the U.S. Capitol, uh, you know, you work on the Hill, that would count. If students have already had internships um, with a federal office, that looks great on their resume. If they come back to the Boren, they don't have, they have three years to start working on their government service as an undergrad after they graduate. Uh, so if a student comes back their junior year or they come back their senior year, they still have a year of college. If they do a, in, a government internship as a student, for example, they do an internship on the Hill or somewhere else uh, for the U.S. government, that could count toward their service and they haven't even graduated yet. So normally folks get full-time jobs uh, in the government, GS7, GS9, what have you, but the um, internships count as well. So. That's great. And my last question, and, and again, folks, so you don't have to listen to me. Feel free to jump in. Um, it sounds like the program is really flexible and, and has such great uh, ability for students to piece things together. But what makes a candidate stand out from in those 800 applications? You talked about the, the compelling case for what they're going to do, but are there other things that really make an applicant rise to the top, particularly maybe if they don't come from a, a DC-based school where internships and a lot of that has been thoroughly entrenched. Right. So one of the best things you can do to make yourself more um, competitive in this application is the uh, interest in studying abroad for a longer period of time. So if you can get a student to do commit to 12 months overseas, that's one of the first things that the committee looks at. Is how long do they want to be in country? Uh, if it's 12 months, they know this person has a serious commitment to, to the country, to the program. The next thing they look for is that government service. Where, have they spelled out in good detail in uh, where they want to work and does it make sense with what they're studying. So for example, somebody who is studying development, um, it would make sense that they're applying for jobs at USAID and Peace Corps and other programs like that. Where it wouldn't make sense if they say, you know, I'm studying this world development, I'm, I'm a Habitat for Humanity Club member, and I can see myself working for the CIA. That may not, that's, that may not, or you know, I can work at the CIA or NSA or Peace Corps, like if they put, just start throwing agencies out, it's not as compelling. So I think the committee looks at people that have really done their homework. They don't say they just want to be a government, you know, a, um, a foreign service officer, which is a very common answer. They actually talk about the, 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 the job itself, saying I'm very interested in the foreign service, and then kind of go into detail about what career path they'd like to take after their initial 
um, two year stint at an embassy. You know, there are different, if, if you're not familiar with the Foreign Service, there are different ways you can go about a career there. And the folk and the, the application who talks into detail about these kind of jobs, it shows the committee that they're really interested in it and they're not just trying to think out of the, off the top of their head where they could work. And that's very that's rare, especially in the undergrad um, applications. That's rare. So. For grad school uh, applications, me, too. Yeah, <laughs> let, let, me give, let me give you the numbers just so you have them. Uh, we had 794 applications for the grad, uh, undergrad program last year with a roughly 200 and change getting into it. Uh, I think it was a 20, I think we had a 24% chance of winning, uh, which is pretty good for a program like this. For the graduate program, it was even better. Uh, 300 applications for 120 awards, 125 awards, so better than a, a one in three chance. So the, the numbers are there to make it um, very, especially for the graduate students, it is very competitive. It's not, sorry, it's very, it's very good for an applicant uh, to win. It's not as competitive as some of the other applications. That's wonderful. Thank you, Michael, so much. And folks, again, we'll share the slides. And we have a series of handouts that I will share with you shortly, as well as the availability of this recording soon on our website and the, all of the born wonderful webinars and handouts and resources that they've already got up there. So hopefully uh, next year, one of those 200 students studying abroad will be some of yours. I hope so. <laughs> thanks to everybody who attended and thanks especially to Michael for all of this great wisdom. Thanks guys, looking forward to hearing your questions on the email. Take care.